Thank you for joining us today. My name is Christina and I will be moderating today's discussion. I'm today with uh, Phil Gamarelan, editor at Cochrane's Edition and assistant professor at Crook School of Peace Studies, University of San Diego, and Zaur Shiriev, South Caucasus Analyst at Crisis Group. Um, well, the Armenian Azerbaijani negotiations have been in a deadlock uh, for years, uh, for a very long time. Well, and even after the Second Karabakh War, there were no major negotiations or uh, progress in the negotiations between the sides. However, in the past month or so, we are observing very fast developments, especially after the meeting organized by Charles Michel uh, on April 6th. The sides basically left that uh, meeting with an agreement to work on draft of the peace deal. Uh, and while the items of the peace deal are uh, not known uh, or are still to be drafted, however, um, there are al already some, especially in Armenia, turbulent processes um, um, because of this um, uh, development and negotiations. So today we will be discussing these developments. Uh, first of all, why now? And then un to understand the positions and interests of the sites involved in the process. And then finally, um, we would like to discuss today uh, if Armenia and Azerbaijan eventually sign a peace agreement, what items shall be included in that agreement to make it more sustainable. Um, I will ask Zaur and Phil to start the discussion. However, today uh, we would also be happy to hear from you, our audience members. And there are uh, two ways to engage in the discussion. Uh, first, you can submit questions to our panelists in the Q&A section, and we will address them after our panelists will uh, address the main questions we already have in the agenda. And then uh, you can also raise a hand uh, and, um, and uh, say uh, your comment um, by joining the panel. Uh, and I will be moderating that discussion. I will turn on uh, your camera or the audio and then you can share your comments and the question. However, for that, I will ask you to uh, formulate your comment in advance uh, and um, um, try to keep it on point uh, and really short in order to have a um, um, chance to hear uh, more comments from everyone, whoever is interested. So first I want to ask Phil, could you start the discussion? And um, the, the first question I think that we should start from, uh, why now, uh, what are, um, why a sudden activation of peace process or maybe it's not sudden at all? Uh, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Christina. So It is somewhat sudden, given that two years almost went by after the uh, end of the war uh, in 2020, and uh, this activation is recent. Uh, but short answer to why now, I'd say, is the war in Ukraine. Uh, and the long answer is essentially why, uh, what does the, what did it change? And three points there. Uh, one is that if until now Armenia and Azerbaijan for like 30 years perceived each other as the main like, threat, uh, I think that perception has been changing because if Ukraine, the biggest country in Europe, uh, can be attempted to be uh, colonized effectively, uh, then so can any other uh, former post-Soviet country. So I think the uh, perception of what's possible in world politics, uh, not perception, but rather the world politics have changed uh, with the uh, Ukraine invasion. And so the perception of each other as a threat is probably still there, but more as a manageable small threat compared to uh, a great power uh, takeover is effectively or becoming a proxy <clears throat> fight for great powers. Uh, so that's one. Uh, second uh, is that European Union and United States that were effectively pushed out uh, from the region uh, by or during the Second Karabakh War with Russia's and Turkish position um, strengthening are now trying to stage a comeback. Uh, and uh, luckily for us, not militarily, but uh, through diplomacy and uh, becoming more active in the negotiation process and supporting negotiation process. Uh, and the third one is the relative domestic strength, I would say, of uh, the current government, uh, much more clear in Azerbaijan, where uh, following the victory essentially in the Second Karabakh War, uh, 
probably some level of compromise from the Aliyev government will be tolerated more than it would have been before the war. Um, and Armenia is, of course, much less stable uh, uh, in that sense. Uh, and yet you have a government that's been twice elected uh, legitimately, which is a big difference for the, compared to past 30 years. Uh, so you do have, again, a government that effectively run on the platform of normalization now, trying to stage a normalization. Uh, so in effect, it does have a popular mandate, which is, again, something relatively new because none of the previous two, three governments had uh, either run on that uh, or were elected legitimately enough to be able to uh, essentially stake out enough political capital to do this. So these are the three, all of them, I think, are, well, two, first two at least are a result of the war in Ukraine. So. Thank you, Zaur. Um, what are your analysis of why, why is sudden activation in the peace process? Uh, thank you. I, I do agree with all points that uh, the Phil uh, mentioned, but so I, I, I also see that the war in Ukraine can be considered as a, one of the main determinants of the, uh, the activation, act, activation of the peace the process but uh, but we must be very careful about when saying this uh, because uh, because when the war broke out uh, in ukraine uh, it was thought that this would lead a new clash in in Karabakh conflict zone uh, that's what happened so the second assumption was that uh, because of the war in ukraine the western and uh, russia will be focus more to, to Ukraine and other issues rather than the Karabakh. And uh, even the Russian mediated, uh, the process is not going to be active for a longer time. Uh, so actually we observed this uh, since the Sochi uh, meeting of the uh, leaders in November last year. So what they agreed about the border limitation, but uh, we haven't seen uh, the implementation because they were also the deadline that time that the deadline was the, at the end of the uh, year. So, so there are, there are uh, so the clear indication that the Russia is not focused to, to, to this issue. But, uh, uh, but uh, so second exception was that the Western and, and the Russians will not focus to this, but uh, contrary, I think EU became one of the proactive uh, the player in this process. But actually, uh, EU was a uh, active uh, but careful player in this format uh, even before the uh, war broke out in Ukraine. But uh, so especially the first time, the last November, the EU uh, helped size to resuming the uh, the negotiation or the, the, the direct channel within the, uh, the defense ministers. So what you achieve after March that okay, right now we have also direct channel between the senior uh, uh, leaders uh, uh, representatives. So, uh, but what uh, Ukraine also might be uh, could be a catalyst effect because the Ukraine showed the size also the uncertainty, uncertainty about this uh, the situation. The, and also the the because we will see and we are already seeing the, the impact of the economic the social impact of the Ukraine war to this region, and the region will be considered so any kind of the uh, so the, uh, the peace deal or any stability is much more important uh, this turbulent time. The second reason is that uh, I think. Uh, so Azerbaijan is talking uh, and Azerbaijan leaders are already talking about a peace deal, but the first time I think in this March, they outlined their principles, how they see the, the, uh, the, uh, the peace deal. So before that, it was only the, uh, so the call to the peace deal and peace negotiation. And the last thing I think what's important uh, right now, uh, why this is also happening is that uh, because EU is not uh, doing the classic mediation. So EU is, is facilitating the direct uh, bilateral talk between the Azerbaijan and Armenia. This is different what uh, the Minsk Consuls and the Russia did or Russia is doing. So this is some, something that actually facilitator is something that is not telling you what to do and how to do it. Facilitator is just uh, opening the space and helping you to, to discuss. So uh, with more bilateral talks, uh, I think there will be much more trust. And also uh, I have observed myself that okay, while talking to some senior leaders, uh, senior people in, in Baku, that okay, they see many positive uh, the messages coming from, from Armenia. It's not only the, uh, the, uh, the prime minister, 
uh, spoke up at the parliament. Even before that, even the, the small things actually considered as, uh, as, 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 as important things in Bapol. Uh, so uh, overall, I think that right now the situation we can call is a cautiously optimistic uh, situation. So we should be cautiously optimistic about what will happen next. But at least uh, the most important thing is that there is a direct channel and direct negotiations. Uh, so that that's important. And also that the, one of the assumptions of the Ukrainian war is not uh, happened. At least the, the, there is a much more focused uh, issue. Uh, thank you. And thank you for mentioning that the, the format has changed and now the negotiations are more, you know, the format is more about facilitation of direct um, bilateral negotiations. And here, I think it's also important to understand then what are the positions or the kind of uh, the, um, the the interests with which sides are um, entering the room. So Phil, uh, first I want to ask you, what are your observations and analysis of the interests um, uh, of the Armenian side? What are the underlying um, yeah, interests uh, in Armenia, in Yerevan? Oh. So uh, a lot of it is uh, quite public, right? We can see that starting from actually the uh, pre-election uh, platform and then uh, quite consistently uh, uh, continuing, uh, there is a shift away from quite uh, military rhetoric that preceded 2020 war uh, to kind of towards normalization, both with Turkey and with Azerbaijan. Uh, so I think the uh, government's agenda is quite transparent. Uh, I see one, it's not a direct answer to your question, but I see one in a potential uh, discursive problem that the government is very much staking its uh, newfound uh, peace interest uh, on this uh, discourse that or narrative that the, what we have now is effectively the same bill that we would, would have through negotiations prior to 2020. I think it's a very problematic thesis, which has been voiced both by Pashinyan and by a lot of the, his proxies and uh, uh, MPs in parliament and so on. Why it's problematic? For many reasons. Uh, first of all, that's a major disrespect uh, to the lives of uh, thousands of people who died, uh, who uh, could have been alive now. Uh, but second, it's not true at all because uh, the Madrid principles uh, were quite a comprehensive peace agreement that were dealing with questions of security, of status, one way or another, status was not determined, but it was very clearly uh, a major part of negotiations that was to be solved. Uh, displaced people, very, very importantly, demilitarization of the seven regions, uh, which are now, of course, militarized and are uh, major kind of security uh, threat or chance for a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan now very much comes from these regions being militarized as opposed to demilitarized. And I can continue the list, but there's nothing close essentially between how comprehensive uh, and that agreement could have been uh, and what we have now. And more importantly, almost is that by uh, saying that, that the war would have happened anyways, uh, uh, or what we have now is the same Armenians, the government is kind of giving away its agency in this, as in they are not an actor that contributed to the war, or they are not an actor who could have uh, signed a peace agreement prior. And I think this a sense of agency, self-agency is extremely important um, dynamic here, because for this to move anywhere, for normalization between Armenia and Azerbaijan to move anywhere, uh, the sense of agency uh, of Armenia as a government, uh, as a state, should be reclaimed, and that starts from also accepting responsibility for the actions you took prior. So with that aside, <laughs> uh, we see a clear yeah, uh, leaning of the government towards normalization. Uh, it's uh, also uh, it's quite specific, effectively, in two things. A, saying that they, in principle, accept the five points uh, proposed by Azerbaijan, so that's already is gives some new uh, content, let's say, to negotiations. And two, uh, on the level of prime minister, they talked about the uh, lowering of the plank uh, when it comes to the Karabakh status, which uh, effectively uh, means accepting uh, the de jure uh, jurisdiction of Azerbaijan uh, over Karabakh, whether it's said publicly or not, that seemed to be pretty clear subtext there. Uh, what's missing, I think, though, uh, from the discussion is that what happens then to Karabakh? Uh, we, the, because so Pashinyan was moving it into the realm of um, human rights, which is an important uh, development, of course. 
Uh, but what does it mean? How do you ensure human rights? Uh, there still should be some conversation or conversation rather of the status of Karabakh. Yes, let's say the Armenian government accepting it as not talking about independence anymore. Well, what is it then, right? So that conversation is missing. It's still tabooed and that should start becoming a discussion at least on the expert level. What are the possibilities for a status? If it's an autonomy, what form of autonomies are possible? What are the precedents uh, around the world? So that's an important part of a conversation that should at least theoretically uh, uh, be voiced and start being discussed uh, because we are talking about lives of hundreds, over 100,000 of people and their safety. Right, thank you, Phil. And yeah, let's keep that in mind to address in later questions, uh, the issue of status and basically what next, what would be part of the um, um, of this peace agreement, what should it look like? But then, uh, Zaur, I want to also ask you, what do we hear from Baku? What are the underlying interests there? Um, I think uh, the first of all, uh, the Azerbaijan opening position is that, uh, the, the, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the peace agreement should be based on the five principles. So, and, uh, and, uh, and also, and this should normalize uh, the uh, relations with Armenia, and this, this should also eliminate the possibility of the new war between the sides. So, uh, but while talking to the officials in Baku, they say that they have an extended version of this, the five principles. So this is not that only uh, they made public and they also negotiating with Armenian side about this, uh, the five principles. Uh, so extended version of the five principles, but there is no answer that whether this is going to be limited to the five principles or there will be other issues because we are, we are going to answer this question the uh, uh, in your next question. Uh, so the second issue is that about border delimitation. So there is no illusion is that, uh, so they, they see that border delimitation and immigration of the borders is one of the important integral part of this process, but, uh, but uh, they see also this is an integral part of the peace agreement, but, uh, but uh, 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 peace agreement should, should, should uh, sh uh, this border delimitation shouldn't block the peace agreement negotiation. So, and these are the two separate issues, but also the, they somehow they're linked to each, each other. So there's no illusion that border delimitation will, be, will happen soon. So it could take them many times, I don't know, might be years, uh, but uh, the principles should be agreed by the side. The, the third issue is that uh, <clears throat> about the transport corridor. So, and this should uh, go parallel because as you know, that main issue is that they have an agreement about the railway, but they don't have an agreement about the hi highway of the, the roads. So these three issues, peace agreement as a separate issue, the board limitation and uh, the transport corridor or the communication uh, between the sides. So this is the underlying interest and, and also Probably and um, uh, most of uh, uh, issues also related to the the future of the Russian peacekeeping forces in the in the in the conflict zone. So after 2025, and what I see in Baku, uh, and this is actual direct impact might be also the Ukrainian war is that uh, so before uh, there is uh, uh, no one actually authoritatively talked about this uh, Russia should leave on 2025, but right now we see uh, in public or also in the private conversation that uh, they they consider the, that the mission should end uh, 2025 but the question is that uh, what will replace it or whether they uh, what kind of the security guarantees what kind of the security will be replace this uh, the arrangement and there are many other, other questions so we know the uh, as i said we know on the opening position of the baku the bargaining position we don't know about the full uh uh, how to say the full proposal, and uh, might uh, and also one thing uh, last last point is that one thing is important, and they see that in Baku the peace agreement should be finalized soon. I mean that in the shorter term, not it shouldn't take the years. Uh, so this is the one of the uh, interests underlying the interest of the Baku. Um, thank you. Well, uh, this is an extremely sensitive process um, of drafting and then moving forward towards the peace agreement. And it is full of possible spoilers and, and risks. So uh, what are the key risks that, that you see um, moving forward? And Zaur, uh, maybe you could take th this question first. Uh, I think, I mean, uh, probably Phil, Phil talk more, but I, uh, I mean, what I see is that, uh, first of all, internal instability in Armenia is a big risk in this process. Uh, so, uh, so the second biggest risk is that uh, Russian position, 
uh, because Russia, so uh, we should understand or we should perceive that we should understand that the Russia sees the 2020 war uh, ceasefire and also Russian mediation is a success story. So in the post-Soviet space. So um, they are underlining and they're perceiving it is something that Russia did differently in entire post-Soviet space. So, so that's why uh, Russia, uh, for now, we don't see that, okay, despite the, the uh, Russian, some officials calls about this uh, Western act, active position is criticized by, uh, by Russian officials, or they don't see that uh, the West is cooperating with them. But at, at the, so the, the question is that how keeping the Russia on board and also uh, and not to making the Russia should uh, act differently. And so, so this is the biggest risk. And, and I mean that, so this two facilitation process, so how they can integrate this process, how they can support each other. So this is the second, second big, biggest risk I can say. Uh, another might be uh, risk is that even one disagreement, uh, one, uh, this agreement can lead any kind of the house instability in the border regions. So any escalation in the border regions, even the, the one shooting or uh, could actually destabilize the situation and uh, can uh, remove all the possibilities or can actually disturb this process. So this is the, this is somehow the biggest risk. Thank you, Phil. Um, uh what risks do you see? And maybe you could also elaborate more. I think many are interested about the processes happening in Armenia. Um, yeah. Thank you. And yeah, I think also have been seeing comments from the audience. Uh, thank you for asking this question about what's happening in Armenia. Um, and uh, yeah, how that can impact the process. So what's happening, probably everybody who is following can see that there are ongoing protests uh, very much connected to the activation of uh, negotiations and especially uh, Pashinyan's pronouncement about this lowering the plank, um, which again is understood, I believe correctly, that it means uh, accepting essentially the jure, at least the jure jurisdiction uh, of Azerbaijan over Karabakh. Uh, and that understandably led uh, to protests. Uh, the protests are also led by effectively the former uh, government uh, or Kocheran Sarkisian uh, coalition, uh, which in turn limits uh, the appeal of the opposition. So what we've been seeing is that uh, uh, there is a, enough support. So there is a quite stable basis for support for the opposition. The uh, protests are ongoing, they are daily, they do attract uh, sometimes tens of thousands of people. Um, at the same time, they are not growing. Right. So it does seem to be the, if the election results, let's say, are not necessarily uh, changed in terms of the public support for uh, Pashinyan versus the current opposition. Uh, so it does seem to be, again, stable, uh, committed following of the opposition within its uh, scope and limits, let's say, is not growing. Uh, so that probably uh, means that there will not be a uh, popular uh, uprising big enough to uh, be able to uh, challenge Pashinyan's government, whether or not he moves forward with the negotiations. So I don't see a revolution uh, as such happening. At the same time, uh, kind of less legitimate, yeah, kind of less popular yeah, means uh, of coming to power by the opposition are within the realm of possibility. Uh, one is a possible coup. Uh, that will depend, of course, on a lot of factors, but uh, does not, uh, at this point, doesn't look outside of possibility. It might well be considered. Uh, by the opposition. Uh, and the second is uh, some form of a uh, well, worst case civil war, uh, uh, less worst case uh, violent clashes that do destabilize Armenia to a point where uh, it's essentially too long then involved in internal struggle. So these are two very scary yeah, the, the developments either way, given that there is a, for the first time in many, many uh, decades, irrespective of uh, our attitude towards Pashinyan, we have a leader that's been twice essentially elected popularly. Uh, so anything that if we see look in the region, any kind of uh, coup that's uh, or any kind of instability and civil war, then plunge a country into a state from which it's very hard to come out for another few decades. So it's a very serious risk for Armenia itself, of course, first of all, 
but then by extension will of course also uh, sabotage any chance of normalization at least in the short term uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan so that's a very serious uh, yeah threat I agree with that uh, with our uh, uh, and the second is uh, somewhat potentially connected but to um, an escalation between Armenia and Azerbaijan is becoming a, pro a second um, front, let's say, uh, in the proxy Russia-NATO war. And so uh, there is clearly Russia-Ukraine war uh, in place, I think, but it's, this war has at least two dimensions or maybe more. There is also Ukraine war internally, but you have now Russia-Ukraine war, but you also have effectively a proxy war between Russia and NATO being fought in Ukraine. So these two are happening simultaneously. And that is quite unpredictable where this proxy war essentially uh, will expand. Moldova uh, seems very likely or at least possible, right? What next? Is there next? Uh, and so Caucasus seem to be not stable enough region that always to be a possibility. Uh, currently, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Caucasus is probably benefiting from uh, attention being somewhere else and being left to its own devices, but that can change, uh, right? Uh, and neither uh, Russia nor I would say United States potentially are, can be trusted in long term of uh, not wanting to see uh, a proxy war move to uh, this area. So that's a very serious uh, element and that could be prevented if the Armenia and Azerbaijan don't go against each other, right? So the way to exploit this and turn this into a proxy war is to uh, pin these two against each other and instability, war, violence that then can be escalated into a support of for one or the other by external actors turning it into uh, a serious threat. So all of it comes back to as much as Armenians as Azerbaijanis don't like each other and have been threat to each other, the realization that again this is a manageable threat compared to what could happen if the big players are involved actively hopefully will uh, lead us to a place of relative stability or commitment to the peace process. Thank you. Before moving forward uh, with my other questions, I want to um, thank those that are already submitting questions in the Q&A and remind one more time that if you have any comments, uh, please submit them in the Q&A. And actually, it would be great that if you, even if you plan to raise your hand to uh, join the panel uh, for a up to three minute uh, comment. Uh, please also type it in, in, in the q and section that will help us uh, to also navigate what is relevant at which point, but also for you, it will definitely be helpful to formulate your thoughts in two, three sentences. Um, the next question that I want to um, ask you, Phil and Zaur, uh, is, uh, well, the there is no draft of the peace deal. The only thing we know again are the five principles brought up by uh, Aliyev and presumably uh, the Armenian side uh, agrees to that indirectly, um, uh, but kind of that, that, that's the message from Yerevan. Uh, but now that it is probably in the process or to be drafted, uh, what are the topics that you think should be uh, are important to be included uh, uh, in the peace agreement in order for it to be sustainable uh, and to last. Uh, Zaur, maybe uh, you start. Okay, uh, I mean, before uh, directly answering your question, I think uh, what should be included in the peace agreement, I think uh, <clears throat> I'm dividing this process in the, uh, the three uh, phase. One is that uh, the environment. So the peace negotiation environment, not not between the leaders, uh, between the countries, but also the, so it's impact to their society. So they should be uh, the the process should be like uh, in a form that it should be accepted by the societies, and also they should be confidence to this process, at least the confidence, because uh, even when the peace agreement is signed between the parties, so the people are asking the three questions. The first of, first one is that Israeli war, is, is the war real over? Second is that who really won, uh, in which way was the agreement titled? And the third is that uh, who will hold the conflict parties to the agreement uh, uh, they have signed? So in order to, uh, people should have a clear answer to th these three questions, uh, they, should have a, uh, they should have a confidence to, the, to this uh, the process. So how you can, uh, ex uh, how you, you can make this to happen? I think first of all, uh, the accusatory tone in official rhetoric should be removed from both sides. 
So they shouldn't accuse each other and they, uh, the population should see that the, the leaders and also their governments are actually holding on and they're supporting this process. And uh, the second is that uh, they shouldn't be, uh, this is minimum uh, the recipe. Uh, the second, there shouldn't be any military clash or any kind of the, the small military, uh, how to say, uh, escalation that uh, could be end uh, the in the loss of the soldiers or the uh, the, the civilians, and the stability and the full uh, ceasefire is 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 essential, and also uh, also there should be uh, some gestures uh, by the sides. I mean that humanitarian issues, uh, for example, about the detainees, and also in the case of Azerbaijan, this is the, uh, the the fate of the missing persons. So they, they sh the I think this the both sides should uh, show. They are the also gesture to each other. Uh, so this is minimum, and also there should be. Uh, uh, and the last point about this, uh, there should be a real process of uh, the dialogue uh, uh, between the uh, societies. So it should it shouldn't be uh, limited to the civil society dialogue or the dialogue between the expert community, which which we don't see. Uh, I mean, it's just visibility. We don't see. Um, I mean, the, they 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 cannot reach to the the whole population. Uh, so I can answer more about this, how I see that is building, but I think this is not a topic of this discussion. Uh, and so what should be included to the peace agreement? And second uh, stage is that they should be, the peace negotiation should be as inclusive uh, as possible from the beginning. Uh, so this is, the, this is the key issue. And the involvement of the civil society in some form is important because uh, we saw that in implementation of this peace agreement, the civil society plays a, a greater role in, in other conflict of the regions. Uh, uh, it's true that civil society is a broad concept and the parties to conflict can uh, view factions of civil society very differently, but at least there should be some transparency, uh, transparency about this issue. Uh, the second thing is that uh, so there should be a mechanism how it's going to be impl implemented. It should be taken the, in, in the beginning uh, into account. The third is the treaty status. So that uh, treaty status will be uh, endorsed by the Security Council or uh, this will, could be only the um, uh, bilateral level uh, uh, agreement. So, and, uh, and then there should be more working groups. As we know that uh, the sites are uh, planning to uh, uh, to have uh, their working groups, but so they should be working group, groups should include, uh, should discuss every question. First of all, the fate of the, uh, for, for example, uh, one of the security issues uh, after 2025, uh, fate of the Karabakh Armenians and uh, how the sites see this, the future, and what have the guarantees can be given. Uh, so then there should be also the missing person and other things should be also the one of the committee and rehabilitation. So many, many working groups can be uh, created and uh, they, they should be much more involvement of the, the civil society or the people that have, who can actually contribute to this process. And uh, about this building, the, my last point is about, uh, I think there should be, there is a need a much more, a new design for the peace building. So there are two sides. Sometimes the local uh, actors are blaming the donors and the uh, donors blames the, the local actors that they are not active. They are not actually, they don't, they have a lack of capacity. And the local actor says that uh, the donors actually is uh, implementing this uh, peace building uh, activities without taking account the realities on the ground. So how to merge this process and to uh, to support each other? I think first of all there should be inclusiveness of, of the uh, to this process. There should be more actors, not only the experts and the civil society. There should be um, musicians, actors. I don't know environmentalists and many many people. So this this should uh, lead to the national dialogue. So national dialogue first of all in, inside Azerbaijan. I think Azerbaijan in society they should discuss first of all that how they see peace. So how they're going to reconcile and then. I think there's the cross-border things could be much more meaning, meaningful. I think the same is true probably uh, for Armenia. And uh, what I see the, uh, about this process is the lack of the media component. Uh, so, for example, when I see when I see the uh, Armenian Turkish process, uh, so before the Zurich Protocol signed in size, I think this uh, the uh, the size can learn many things from the Turkish Armenian the process that about how they did how they involve also the private sector how uh, they manage this the 
so the dialogue process, so because the, it was a very tangible process. So I think the Azerbaijan and Armenians can learn from this process. So, uh, and media will be a very important uh, component because we will see more disinformation and misinformation in this process. We are all seeing, and there is a there is no trust to all media. So they should post somehow the uh, trust for the media for both sides that they can trust and they can hear. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing um, hands already. Uh, once we finish with our uh, two more questions for the panel, and then we'll definitely uh, address and give a voice to you. But uh, could I please ask you to type, uh, you know, very shortly your comment in the Q and A section as well, so we could see it. Uh, um, yeah, and thank you in advance. So Phil, uh, the same question to you. So okay, if there is a clear peace deal, uh, what do we do? How do we make it? Um, you know, relevant and sustainable, um, especially for the societies that will have to live with that peace agreement on the ground. All right. So one is that we are very much in agreement with what Zaur was saying. The um, civil societies are actually completely missing uh, from this conversation, and that's of actually the first time uh, in the whole thirty years. Uh, all the previous. Uh, negotiations and all the previous phases included pretty active involvement of civil society and uh, analytic community uh, in this conversation. So because of that, I'll separate two things. One, what the government uh, kind of what should be in the peace agreement potentially, right? And the second, which was your question. And second, what a peace process should look like. Uh, in terms of what should be in a peace agreement, uh, I agree it should be comprehensive uh, in terms of Every topic should be discussed, right? So you cannot, you need to discuss, of course, economics, which is seem to be very central, and the limitation uh, of the borders and the marcation. Uh, but you cannot be limited to that, right? Because to, for it to be sustainable, there are many, many other issues of safety, uh, first of all, uh, but then followed to by uh, you know, for been 30 years of uh, very uh, serious enmity uh, and mutual isolation. Uh, so all of that needs to be uh, considered of how are these two societies will be living at least side by side, uh, potentially to a degree integrated at least uh, in, in Karabakh. So all of that requires a lot of heavy work. Uh, it should be sequenced. It doesn't mean we simultaneously should yeah, do the uh, some, some, you know, some more basic things such as opening of diplomatic relations. Uh, uh, could go first, but necessarily the peace agreement should consider safety, status, uh, security, war crimes, responsibility for the displaced people, uh, many, many other issues that fall, fall more on the reconciliation end. And we have a quite uh, extensive experience worldwide, of course, of handling it, starting from uh, Europe uh, in the aftermath of World War II. And we've seen that even uh, in a place like Europe that you know, has all the resources and has been committed uh, to the peace process, uh, it took decades uh, for France and Germany, for example, to get to a point of uh, the enmity getting on a non-dangerous level, let's say, right? So that on its own will require the reconciliation of any form will require decades, but it's not simply decades passing by, it's decades of intent intentional work. So this is where I fully agree with Zaur that uh, that, that cannot happen with this, without civil society, right? The governments, yes, are very important actor. Uh, and of course, the start of the normalization should come from them. Uh, but the reconciliation itself cannot proceed uh, without the heavy involvement of civil society. Uh, and we've seen that in, uh, again, Turkey, Armenia, I fully agree with Zaur in this one as well, that even when the official negotiations faltered, uh, the civil society engagement allowed to continue building trust and uh, reconciliation effectively. And what you have now between Turkish and Armenian people, the enmity is there, but it's not close to anything which was about 30 years ago. We have the opposite uh, between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Uh, so uh, given that the topics that should be included uh, in negotiations, I would say uh, you know, the, how to open up the space for uh, the civil society to come in. And that includes also the expert community because the governments, uh, yes, maybe demarcation, the limitation, diplomatic relations are within their realm. But uh, there are many other questions that uh, are yeah, pretty small, you know, uh, non experienced, let's say, governments in terms of negotiations might not have the expertise in things like transitional justice, in things like uh, the changing, you know, working with memory uh, because we have, uh, again, 30 years of 
mass violence and uh, building enemy image, right? So these are other topics that governments might not be uh, necessarily uh, quite proficient. And that's where the civil society and expert community can be uh, very instrumental. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Zaur. Uh, I have one more question, but before maybe I will just leave it for kind of the closing of the of today's discussion. And I want to address some of the questions, which I'll actually echo with with the one I have. Uh, one question in the Q&A from the audience is about the the role of different um, third party actors. Uh, for example, uh, how do, so the question goes, how do you see the future role of the OIC means group in the current peace process? And then how do you see Russia, France and the US collaborate given the war in Ukraine? And um, yeah, and, and the also um, question about Lavrov's comment on, on the West sacrificing interests of Armenia and Armenians. Uh, so yeah, in short, uh, how do you see the role of different um, actors um, in this process? Mm -hmm. I think the key issue that I underlined before that okay, these actors shouldn't make this as a geopolitical competition in the area of Azerbaijan Armenian uh, peace uh, the process so then actually the losers, losers will be as original in Armenia so this is the key issue for me and uh, and uh, yes I mean uh, th there were assumption that uh, the, the Karabakh uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict was the only area that over the even the let's say on the last uh, 20 years 25 years the West and Russia Corporated each other, so this is the area of cooperation. But I think we exaggerated this. So this was a sim symbolic cooperation, but we haven't seen that these sides actually discuss very uh, key questions like the secret questions, the peacekeeping forces. So they weren't in agreement. So I mean, we cannot assume that the West and Russia agreed. Uh, so all topics and all uh, the, the things when it comes to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. So, but probably uh, we can also assume that the modern principles, so basic principles that what they offered might be the, 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 also the result of their cooperation uh, symbolically. Uh, so, I mean, uh, so uh, I, I think simultaneously uh, their support is key. I mean, I see that France, uh, the United, might be United States is the least, that France uh, uh, could support the European Union active process. And also probably there will not be any kind of the dialogue that they used to have between the Russian and uh, uh, other misgroup uh, culture countries. So, so how they, how I think the Azerbaijan and Armenia should benefit from this, this process that they don't need, a, they, they need a facilitators uh, so to engage with them, but not to somehow uh, to tell them how to do and what to do. So this could help them a lot. And I see that probably simultaneously they can support each other and separately they can support each other. I mean, these uh, two countries, but I hope that they will, it will not be a became a geopolitical competition and uh, when there will be some uh, decision uh, uh, key moments uh, between, between the sides. And also other other countries also should involve. For example, I mean one of the key components of this uh, the peace deal is that not only between it's happening between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and also there is a Turkish Armenian process. So we shouldn't. Uh, so uh, we should include also this Turkish Armenian process, and also the uh, any tangible results on this front also will impact uh, positively to this Azerbaijan Armenian dialogue. So and also economic impact and other things are in terms of mean normal is much more will be much more huge economically and also psychologically to, to 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 the region. So that's why we shouldn't ignore this and and Turkish support to this process and different support also the okay, that, that that key factor. I, I think. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, no, agree with a lot of it, uh, and um, the key is here for this to be sustainable is probably shift the mindset away from uh, who, you know, the, seeing the mediator as a support group, as opposed to, right, the leader. Uh, because what we saw for 30 or 20 something years uh, that we had uh, the OSC means through mediation, we can agree, I think by this point, it wasn't successful, right? So we ended up in a war without a solution. Why we can discuss for many reasons, but either way, like staking the, uh, 
your faith on yeah, external actors to doing the work for you is certainly uh, not effective, let's say. So in that sense, I agree with Zaur that the key is to have direct negotiations, uh, by all means then uh, working with every external actor. And of course, Russia is very central, uh, big neighbor, right? So uh, European Union has been supportive and kind of its norms and uh, the experience of uh, post-World War II reconciliation can be very major uh, support in you know, uh, helping to think through the mechanisms for solution, right? So without necessarily uh, handing it to somebody and either against looking as in cutting off somebody else, but also simply handing your fate again to the third party. Hasn't been effective, will not be effective. Uh, can Minsk Group itself become a, a platform for dialogue between Russians and Americans and the Europeans? Uh, maybe in some small level, and uh, I heard that comment numerously, right, from co-chairs, including both Russians and Americans in the past, that that was the only platform for a discussion. Uh, and not having it uh, it's on its own is a problem, frankly. So maybe it could be revived less for our sake, more for the sake of uh, some negotiations restarting between Americans and Russians. Thank you. Uh, because we have several questions, uh, I want to combine there are two uh, different but interrelated questions that uh, address the issue of inclusivity and openness to the public of the process, because it is so fragile. One question is more about how to reconcile the dilemma of protecting the fragile process, but at the same time keep the publics informed. Um, and then there, there was also another question about uh, if if there is, a, I can find the question, but basically it it goes, uh, do we see in that inclusive format, as you also mentioned, uh, that it should be as inclusive as possible, uh, the uh, representatives of uh, the Armenian Armenian Karabakh Karabakhis um, in, in this process. So maybe you, each of you maybe could address um, these questions, and then I will give a voice to those that raise the hand. Um, Sorry, I missed the first part of the question. The so second was about Karabakh Armenians, and the first part of the question. Uh, was... um, the first part was about uh, kind of how to balance uh, of protecting this fragile process, but also uh, keeping publics informed, um, and also I think involved in in the discourses. Uh, so starting from the second, uh, yeah, I think by all means, uh, the we have the whole thirty something now. We starting from eighties. Uh, almost 35 years of uh, the conflict between uh, Armenians and Azerbaijan is, is about uh, the rights and safety of Karabakh Armenians uh, that then uh, exploded and essentially then became also about rights and safety of Karabakh Azerbaijanis and now about the entire Armenia uh, and what else, right? So, <clears throat> but that's been the start. It will not go anywhere. Uh, and there are like potentially uh, three, four uh, ways of solving it. Uh, some. The two kind of opposite extremes are ethnic cleansing uh, or independence. So I'm hoping that ethnic cleansing uh, is not a serious uh, consideration uh, in whatever form, right? So that means leaves then a quite limited number of options of handling it. But one way or another, uh, it should of course involve a direct discussion with uh, people and representatives of the people who are whose lives are directly. Uh, affected. So yeah, they don't as much as Pashinyan can say or might want not to uh, uh, deal with this and hand this to uh, Russia. Uh, that's not realistic. Uh, you know, as they are too ethnic. Our identities in this region are too heavily ethnic. Um, there will always be a demand, popular demand, yeah, for the government of Armenia to be uh, protecting, in some form, or standing for the rights of um, other Armenians uh, in the region. So. And they cannot be necessarily fully represented by an Armenian government, either in the past, not especially now, where you do have a chasm between uh, Pashinyan uh, and Karabakh Armenians. So that's, in my view, yes, the format should be negotiated, but in some form, there should be, of course, very direct uh, discussion uh, about that. The, on your uh, the first question about the uh, balancing uh, the need for the kind of somewhat closed door negotiations and uh, involvement of publics, that comes back to me to the role of the civil society. And looking again into Turkey, Armenia, uh, the civil society has been very, very actively involved in the past stages of Turkey, Armenia normalization, effectively were the bridge between uh, the official discussions 
and the publics. There was very constant ongoing uh, public debate in local languages uh, about the process. There were like Turkish language, uh, well, Turkish news almost daily published in Armenia. So we could follow the developments in Turkey. In right, So in Turkey, you had a lot of discussions about Armenia, about the uh, Armenian genocide and what else. So you had a, quite a heavy um, involvement and you could understand where the society's red lines are, what the societies are ready to accept, what not, right? So uh, then the civil scientists and experts could explain uh, potentially you know, what one or the other provision of normalization can mean. So that's where I see this current breakdown of that link and uh, kind of moving up to a place where we only have official processes, by the way, in Turkey, Armenia as well, maybe even more so than in Armenia, Azerbaijan, with no support uh, whatsoever from the expert community and civil societies, and no internal debate other than through opposition in the streets, right, about what it means. Uh, it is a serious problem uh, for if even something is signed, right? So the societies will be very unprepared uh, to what is to come next, what does it exactly mean? So I do see a very strong need for, again, this internal and, ex and mutual civil society, journalists, uh, expert level, public discussion. Thank you, Zahur. Uh, do you want to address these questions, any of these questions? Yes, <clears throat> yes, I think this second question about the Karabakh Armenians involvement. I think as, as a representative or as a party, I think this is uh, impossible, but uh, as, as Phil also mentioned, but uh, as I said before, that there should be uh, many working groups are dealing with many issues. And, and definitely I think the Karabakh Armenians should be part of this because they also the fate and they are uh, how, so the things, many things are going to be discussed about, they, are, they will, will, uh, will impact to, to their life and, uh, security and other things so definitely and what format i think this should be discussed between the leaders of Azerbaijan and armenia but how now the second is about this uh, op, uh negotiation process and impact to the public how to inform the public so i mean uh so there are many people are calling and and we, we see also from other public uh, other conflict uh, issues is that people are calling that they should be transparent process i mean most, most of the negotiation process is never been uh, a transparent process. So, I mean, not in the uh, Azerbaijan Armenian case, but on other conflict uh, situation. So what was the transparent is that the, the public informants, the opinion makers, so they played a key role or played or not played a key role. So before uh, as, assuming that the civil society should take a leading role, civil society should, uh, how to say, play a, a, an important role to inform public, so then we, we, we should question in our case that, so they were the mother principles. So the return of the territories, the return of displaced people. So I mean, all things are, were uh, open to the public. So, but the majority of the public, public uh, they, they didn't know about this. So we see that how it has uh, impact of negative impact to both in Azerbaijan and Armenia. So who, who, who's, who's to blame about this situation? So, I mean, the civil society, media. So then I think it, it comes to the, uh, I'm coming to the point that, that okay, it's easy to say that the civil society should involve, but what's, which civil society? So what they also, how they can also transform and also uh, there should be a space for them. For example, I think, okay, we can uh, criticize many elements of the civil society in case of Azerbaijan, but also we can also say that uh, there's no, there wasn't any environment for them uh, to do many things. And also uh, in the case of the track two process, they were very skeptical views in Azerbaijan uh, until the 2020 war uh, for two reasons. First of all, I think the, uh, they see that this is a continuation of the injustice for because of the majority of the displaced people. So their voice is not heard. The second is that government saw, or the many people saw this as a uh, house of preserving status quo. So this uh, tractor process is also helping of this. So right now the things may, has changed, but we haven't seen that okay, the barriers, okay, the barriers uh, is uh, lived out for, for, for civil society. So I think the civil society also criticized themselves and to also to redesign their work and to, uh, to be much more active. Then I do believe that I'm talking about as a, as a original case. So I do believe that okay, they can inform the public. So that's why the critical element that I say that easiest way is that the medium, media involvement uh, so the trust between the media 
So this is the way how they can inform. But in which states that they can inform and what how they can inform is important. As Phil also mentioned that over, therefore the civil society or experts uh, also should be part of the some some of the uh, the official process. Transitional justice, uh, as Phil mentioned, there are uh, there are many things that also should be included. That uh, also the implementation mechanisms uh, in many conflict uh, situations and after uh, signing of the peace agreement, the civil society played a key role of implementation or the monitoring of this, how this was implemented in their societies. So the, the peace deals. So that's why, yes, I do believe that the civil society uh, about expanded and renovated civil society. Thank you. I feel like a, a, a whole other topic for a separate webinar is uh, coming up here about the role of civil society in, the, in this process. Maybe we should think about that as well. Uh, we are running out of time. We have only four minutes left. So uh, you, if you don't mind, I'm um, proposing to extend for five more minutes uh, from, from the time uh, we assigned in order to give voice to those that raised hands. Uh, I see only one at this point, but I there were more before. So Murad Nasipov, um, I, I will turn on your... Um, microphone right now i think now you can um speak but yes, again uh, thank you. please please keep it short um yeah sure okay. so you can hear me right yes we can super thank you very much thanks to you christina uh, uh for moderation and zara and philippe for this uh, for their presentations so uh, i will continue civil society topic uh most of the issues mentioned uh already which i initial hat in in my mind so role of civil society and inclusiveness were mentioned by philippe and zaur uh and detailedness of the process thematical diversity so there were these points which i find all these together um a perfectionist so i i think we had too many chances before that we failed and we have no luxury to be perfect in this case and the I find uh, these points a bit perfectionist uh, on the grounds uh, that the on the grounds that civil society uh, perhaps doesn't uh, have that capacity uh, to contribute. So we need also to question the capacity of so civil society, but also uh, the diversity of the normative grounds on which civil society stands. So, uh, well, there was a question already about complication, the, the, uh, that uh, the question about the protecting fragile process and Zara also uh, mentioned uh, the issues, problems with civil society. So uh, on the other side of the issue, governments, uh, I'm not sure if governments have uh, clear strategies at this point, how they can involve uh, uh, civil society, even if they have willingness to do so, the strategy, uh, a clear strategy is something that both governments need. So I'd like to hear uh, Philippe from, from Philippe and Zara if uh, there are any uh, kind of shaping strategy or ideas uh, on, on the government side, how they can involve civil society. And uh, my final point regarding uh, uh, the process and this perfectionist point I made uh, earlier. Uh, so. Uh, all the time uh, in the previous years, uh, decades, uh, the resolution of the conflict have been seen as the uh, as part of societal transformation, which I fully agree. So it's a pro process that needs to uh, happen before actually negotiations coming to a point and after that. But uh, converting all this process into societal transformation uh, or seeing it so. Uh, is, uh, I think, another perfectionist view which we should avoid. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention I'm uh, from the Eustace Libya University. I've been working in civil society in Azerbaijan before coming to uh, to this position. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Murad. Phil, Zaur, do you want to quickly comment? Sure, I'll, I'll go. Um, well, thank you, Murad. Yeah, absolutely. I actually agree with a lot of what you said. And uh, in the past, uh, in fact, uh, when in the 90s, 2000s, when everybody seemed to be moving towards, at least theoretically, towards a liberal democracy, and liberal democracy was to be the new uh, norm in the world where everybody, right, just one way or another, um, was to become part of the global um, the world. Uh, so that's 
certainly not the case anymore. We are moving in quite different directions uh, since then. Uh, so a lot of the civil society involvement have been perceived from exactly that standpoint, that civil society will help us build democracy and democracy in turn will help us bring minority rights, human rights, and then the status issue, right? So the coexistence will become somewhat secondary because we are kind of all um, liberal democracies with rights protected. So that didn't work out for sure. Uh, now, the question is, uh, in my view, that we need to a decouple completely democracy building from civil society, uh, sorry, from conflict resolution. Uh, it doesn't mean that democracy building on its own is, doesn't have a value, it does, but can, waiting for democracy to arrive so we can stop killing each other, you know, it's a, quite a dangerous at this point proposition. Uh, increasingly, conflict resolution folks are writing about this, uh, Tatsushi Arai, uh, uh, who works in Southeast Asia, recently started writing about functional coexistence, as in minimalistic ways of finding way to coexist without killing each other, right? without coupling that directly with uh, all the provisions such as human rights and democracy and so on. So I think, uh, we, I, in my view, we do need to decouple these things. There is uh, no prospect right now to see Azerbaijan, for example, uh, might be democratizing anytime soon. Right, uh, so I'm not talking about civil society involvement then from this liberal democratic standpoint of let's move toward democracy and that will solve everything. Uh, but in a more basic level, uh, governments have limited functions, right? So and limited expertise. Uh, so there should be a space, democratic or not, for expert community for analysts to talk about topics that you know they are more proficient in. That's one. So as an expert support. But second, there are things that governments are not in a position to discuss, uh, at least early on. For example, status, right? So it's a very key issue where uh, anything any government says about status at this stage will have major political repercussions for them domestically. Uh, and yet we cannot move anywhere without considering different options for status uh, for Karabakh. Yeah, is it uh, cultural autonomy, political autonomy, independence, ethnic cleansing, right? So there are the four possible scenarios on the table right now. Uh, I think, again, as I said, one should be absolutely unacceptable. Uh, but where is the discussion about what does it exactly mean, right? And in expert level, uh, you can look into world experience, uh, right, and talk about this, whether or not we are functioning in a democracy. So that's where I see a role for civil society, essentially carrying the work of public discussion, at least, uh, plus building some trust between people who have to eventually live together uh, that can be done, in my view, whether or not uh, the space is democratic. Thank you. Thank you. Because I don't have any more hands raised, although there were before, I should probably ask you to keep them raised throughout the time because I, I lose, um, I don't see them anymore. So I don't remember who was that, but maybe you changed your mind. Uh, so maybe I should ask you, Zaur and Phil, to do uh, kind of concluding remarks um, and, and maybe answer the question of what would be your recon recommendations to the negotiators. Uh, involved in this process, what would be the key, uh, the most important recommendations you would have at this moment, you know, in this uh, period? Uh, <clears throat> uh, so as a final point, I think, uh, so, I mean, we, we should be uh, so we will see more developments in the coming weeks and uh, months, and uh, hopefully they will be uh, the positive ones. So what what should be uh, my advice or suggestion to the negotiators is that first of all, uh, so I think the mediators or the facilitators should support each other and to help the side to move forward. And uh, second is that uh, there is a need also of thinking about the many scenarios in the region and if there will be peace and the peace in, for, uh, in the case of the peace enforcement, I think the EU should be ready also to, to support economically the, uh, dealing with many issues. So um, this is what I what we can call as a peace investment to the region, uh, especially to Armenia. Uh, and also, uh, so, uh, and, um, and also, uh, so when we talk about, when we say that aggressive society involvement, I mean, we know that uh, the lack of uh, the capacity problem. So this is a uh, tragically 
Uh, so this is a uh, issue for the region uh, or especially in Azerbaijan. So we cannot solve the capacity building of civil society. But what we are suggesting is that in case of Azerbaijan, at least uh, this opinion makers who is going to opinion, they should be informed more about this process. So they can actually uh, to, to give the message to their society, they, they prepare what they can see as a peace agreement. So uh, they shouldn't see the, uh, the peace agreement as something that one side is winning, other side is, is, is losing. So that's why what I asked the three questions that ago, whether war is really over. Second is that who is actually won this the war? Uh, so with the peace agreement, the third is that how they're going to enforce, enforce it. So the, for, for now, I think that simplistic and a very, uh, uh, suggestion is that negotiators that are keep it uh, not uh, competition just to support the process and also uh, and, uh, the, the, our suggestion to the size was about uh, the rhetoric rhetorical change humanitarian gestures and other things uh, if the if it's going to happen so this will help this uh, the process and so first of all the confidence of the process uh, so there should be mechanism to help the society to have a confidence to the process not a piece still yet, so to, to the process. Thank you. And I see we have more questioning, questions coming, but yeah, uh, apologies again. Uh, we don't want to exceed our time too much and also uh, is your time too much. Maybe we'll try to find another way to address them in our future. We'll definitely take them into consideration. Uh, Phil? Well, thank you. Yeah, so the, uh, there will be a great power competition in this region. Uh, and my suggestion is let's make this uh, competition over who is facilitating peace as opposed to who is uh, yeah, helping us fight each other. Uh, because we made it so easy that essentially by keeping the conflict alive that the competition was about who is going to side with whom. Again, if we are committed to the peace process uh, and to uh, yeah, uh, normalization in the long term, then the competition as we are seeing now will be about who is supporting us better uh, in uh, moving towards normalization. That's one. And, uh, I think would be good advice, commit to this process long-term and rule out uh, the resumption of hostilities. Uh, within this, again, it's very important that we do have Russian support. Uh, we had Russian support for the ceasefire and we need to continue building on that. It's also, I believe, very important to restate that the European Union has a, a lot of experience of building uh, post-war uh, linkages uh, and coexistence. I think that's underutilized really in our region uh, experience. And in that sense, European Union's involvement is very important not to overlook and, uh, think, uh, and engage with that. Uh, and then the last point, uh, uh, a couple of commenters raised it, uh, and I want to bring the word Cyprus in, as in the Cyprus as a model, as a, a, a potential for moving forward. I'll say even Cyprus, Cyprus plus. Uh, what I mean by Cyprus is that uh, get to a place of, again, uh, the ruling out violence and uh, allowing some basic level of uh, coexistence in the same space, right? So that's as a short term, you know, getting some rules of engagement that allow mutual visits, yeah, allow, uh, you know, uh, some uh, economic linkages to go through without necessarily immediate solution. Uh, but plus, uh, why plus? Because the Cyprus stopped there in a way, so they are not uh, actively fighting, but not necessarily progressing towards peace either. Uh, and this is where I think that hopefully the difference can be that Yes, as a first step, we need to establish some basic norms of coexistence, uh, simply not fighting each other, not uh, resorting to violence, but then also open up mechanisms for uh, considering uh, steps for a uh, more comprehensive peace moving forward, where circling back to all we said that uh, a role of track two actors, yeah, so those who can discuss topics that governments uh, by their you know, government, position of a government uh, will have a hard time expressing publicly, opening up the space for these more expert level track two discussions, uh, whether by locals or international experts uh, to dis discuss scenarios that, that can help us move towards a more comprehensive piece would be useful. Thank you.